examine their relationship between income inequality and health on both the individual and collective levels, and we consider some of the mechanisms for this effect, including the possibility of social comparison and hierarchy, which are ideas we're going to return to today. And it turns out that the association between income inequality and mortality is considerably stronger than that which can be accounted for at the individual level, as we saw. So we finished last time talking about the individual income explanation. We saw that that might be a small factor, this curvilinear relationship between income and health, but that was only a tiny part. It didn't fully explain it, and we concluded that something else must be going on. And as we also introduced the last time, we talked about relative deprivation that might produce adverse effects inside people's bodies and not just outside their bodies. Um, and these mechanisms, diverse though they are, may reinforce each other, of course, and they may operate at different levels of geographic aggregation, larger and smaller, uh, respectively. So the neomaterial environmental explanation, in addition to being an effect outside people's bodies, may operate at a large area, let's, let's say state level, and the psychosocial environment explanation, which let's say is inside people's bodies, may also operate at a smaller level, like your classroom, you know, your fraternity or sorority or your roommates, for example. You're comparing yourself to them, not to the whole state in which you live, for example. So different geographic levels uh, of uh, aggregation. And it is the case that a reduction in uh, income inequality via income transfers can improve health as a result of this concavity uh, that I discussed earlier in the health wealth curve operating uh, at the individual level. So as we saw the last time, if you have, like for example, in the United States, this is income and this is health, if you take this much money away from this person and you transfer it to this person, you lose just a tiny bit of health for this guy here, and you gain a lot more health for this guy uh, over here. So that the step up in health here is higher than the step down in health. So although the median income stays the same, the actual change in health could be substantial. This was the median uh, health before the transfer, the income transfer right there in the middle level. But now you move some money around, the income, the average income has stayed the same, but the average health went from Y1 to Y3. You've had a change in the level of uh, health as a, as a result. But there's another way, in addition to this issue of individual movement along the curve, there's another way that reducing income inequality might improve health at the population level, and that is that it might shift the whole curve. So another distinct idea, other than transferring, moving people along the curve, is the idea that the whole curve could go up or down. So amongst more equal countries, that health-wealth relationship curve could have shifted up such that for that same level of income, you could have higher health. Or for example, in Ghana, the curve could have shifted down, okay? So what the inequality is doing is not determining where people are on a given curve, but the inequality, if it exists, is doing is shifting the curves up or down, moving the whole curve, changing the fundamental relationship between income and health. So that, for instance, for the same level of wealth, you have different outcomes in an unequal country like Ghana than for an equal country like Sweden. That is, something about living in a context with less inequality might change the whole set point of the wealth-health relationship for everyone in that uh, different context. So the green curve might be Sweden, and the orange curve might be the United States, and for any given income, everyone fares better than Sweden. Conversely, when there's more inequality, the curve might be shifted down. And so this, this idea is that the curve can move up or down. Well, what might be some mechanisms by which income inequality might actually shift the curve? We talked about some new material ideas the last time, some ideas that in a more equal country like Sweden, maybe they allocate resources in a fashion to the whole nation that shifts the curve up, a kind of neo, something different about the material circumstances in Sweden that, are, that changes the nature of the relationship. But today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the psychosocial uh, ideas. And so in fact, hierarchy and inequality, especially if longstanding, and especially if cumulative, can affect individuals' health. Indeed, the point is that hierarchy has always mattered 
because it did when we evolved in the first place. The argument is that we are hierarchical animals. We can't help it. We evolved to be hierarchical animals. We attend to hierarchy. Our bodies have evolved to cope with hierarchy. And so in the modern world as well, we have hierarchy. There's nothing much we can do about it. And part of the reason that a minimum amount of income, as we saw before, remember we, we talked last lecture about, well, why is it the health wealth relationship a step function? You know, why if you get to a certain level, you just step up? Part of the reason it's not that a, that a minimum amount of income is not enough to face the hierarchy and its effects on health is that people have needs beyond necessities, beyond merely being above the poverty line. And this relates to the whole topic of, for example, universal basic income. It's a topic of much discussion these days. It's been tried in countries around the world. There are many reasons to think about such a redistribution, about why we should provide universal basic income. But the idea that doing so will efface the wealth-health relationship, I think, is misguided. And the reason I think it's misguided is that it turns out that these needs that people have uh, that, should I, that, that we need to meet, the needs of people that we need to meet if they're to be healthy, physically and mentally, are broader than just those at the bottom. And these might be arranged in, in very famous Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, raise your hands if you've ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs before. Okay. So the idea here is that people have different needs, at the bottom is like, you know, physiologic needs for air and food and water and sex and sleep and homeostasis that needs body regulation, it's all normal, excretion. Then they have some need for safety, security of the body, employment, resources. Then they have a need for love and belonging, friendship and family and sexual intimacy. Or esteem, you know, do they feel good about themselves? Or what's typically put at the top is this notion of self-actualization, like becoming your own human being which is like a path to wisdom that's very difficult, takes a long time, and not everyone can do it, and not every society is optimized. For why? For this notion of morality, creativity, and spontaneity, and letting go of your prejudices, and learning to accept the world. It's almost a Buddhist kind of transcendence that Maslow describes. And, and the fact that we have these needs arranged in this way is important, because it sheds light on why the health socioeconomic relationship is not, in fact, a step function. And for example, if you consider this, this little fact, when you, got, when you get into the subway in Washington, D.C., and you start in the middle of the subway, in the middle of D.C., and you ride 12 miles, sorry, you start in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and you ride the subway 12 miles, as you ride underground, if you imagine the longevity of the people that are living above you as you're riding the subway for 12 miles, the life expectancy of the local population segment above you rises about one year for every half of each mile that you travel. Poor black men at one end of the journey have a life expectancy of 57 years, and rich white men at the other end have a life expectancy of 77 years. 20 years different in life expectancy, just moving 12 miles underground in this small area in the richest nation on Earth. Why is that? It's not because we're not meeting the physiologic or safety needs by and large, things at the bottom of the people in our society. Almost everyone in our society has enough to eat, okay? And has water and breathing, and they have sex, they sleep, and they have most of these things. So what explains this huge range in life expectancy outcomes if we satisfy these needs at the bottom? Maybe it has something to do with whether we satisfy these higher needs of higher in Maslow's hierarchy. So something else must be going on, and this is well encapsulated by one of you know, the Christian aphorism, man does not live by bread alone. That's what's going on. It's not, you can't, feeding people is not enough to face the impact of hierarchy and to meet the needs of human beings in our society. So, um, uh, um, and so, in fact, there are more needs, it turns out, than those that can be acquired by having enough income to avoid poverty. And in particular, people have needs for autonomy, psychological integrity, and integration into society. These are key needs that human beings have that can be structured by socioeconomic status and that therefore can be translated into health outcomes. There's a social gradient in health even when we move beyond meeting the lowest needs of people, even after we collect, correct the problem of the lack of food and water. And it has something to do with whether these other needs are being met. 
So, um, and this goes back, in fact, to the mechanism of action of the idea of fundamental causes that we discussed a few lectures ago. Failure to meet these needs may lead to metabolic and endocrine changes that in turn place people at risk of death and disease. These are fundamental processes related to autonomy and social integration that play a role here. And these processes are socially stratified so that those at the top get access to more of those immaterial resources than those at the bottom. Now, as usual, teasing out causation is not easy in this situation. But let's get, before we look at some of those examples, and we do some in-class little experiments I'll do with you in just a moment, let's, uh, let's get a basic handle, handle on some of the biology for a moment. So, as many of you probably know, groups of social animals, such as primates, often maintain hierarchies that involve dominance, in turn producing inequalities in access to particular kinds of resources, which then further reinforce the hierarchy. For example, higher ranking primates often eat food from the top of the tree, and that food has more sunlight, and it makes it richer in nutrients. Okay? So just by being on the top, you get access to more resources, which then makes you get more nutritious food if you're a primate, and therefore it reinforces your ability to stay on the top in your dominant status. But interestingly, in many primate orders, including uh, species including our own, sociability can be used as a counterbalance to cope with the stressfulness of hierarchy. And you can contrast the left-hand images with the right-hand images. So these are images of sort of group living primates that live socially, but they're more peacefully living with each other. So they have figured out a way to live together that's not as dominant hierarchy as these primates here over here, okay? Where you have a much more clear uh, hierarchy being expressed within the species. And many of these effects are connected to a very basic sociobiological idea. As the evolutionary biologist Richard Alexander has pointed out, the primary hostile force of nature encountered by human beings is other human beings. The main thing that kills us guys is each other. We don't have many natural predators. So the real evolutionary conundrum that we need to solve is how to live with each other. How are we going to organize ourselves what levels of hierarchy and friendship and cooperation and so forth are we going to implement such that we can live peacefully with each other and be healthier uh, as a result? Because we share all the same basic needs with other members of our species, they are our most feared competitors and can be very threatening. But they can also be a source of friendship, support, and cooperation, and it can therefore be adaptive, evolutionarily speaking, to form groups. That is, conflict is a constant possibility, and this shapes, no doubt, the evolution of behaviors in our species with respect to sociality and our response uh, to hierarchy. So we may think of two contrasting ways to organize human populations, a kind of dominance hierarchy way and a kind of friendship equality way, both of which have left their mark on our bodies and, uh, and how we live and on our behaviors. Now, I don't mean to suggest some deep-seated biological basis for any particular political system. That's not what I'm after right now. But I do want to highlight the fact that we should not be surprised to find that social organization might become embodied, literally, and hence affect the health of individuals. Our bodies are sensitive to what's happening in the social world around us. We take in these effects, and they change our physiology. And so whether we live or die and how healthy we are, we evolve for our health and our longevity to reflect the kinds of social arrangements in which we find ourselves. For example, as part of the fight or flight response, as you all know, our bodies adaptively release hormones which make blood clotting easier. So when, you, when it comes time to fight with an opponent, as you probably all know, your, blood, your body redistributes blood to those parts of your body that are useful for fighting, like your muscles, and reduces blood flow to those parts of your body, like your intestines, which are useful for eating. Okay? And it does other things, like you, part of the fight or flight response is it enhances your sensitivity to senses, your pupils dilate to let in more light, your nose, your nares flare to smell what's happening, right? You're, you just, your ears cock forward a little bit too, so you can hear more. All of a sudden, you're all ready. And one of the things that your body also does is it suddenly pumps out more fibrinogen. 
Fibrinogen is a protein in the clotting factor in your, that your liver makes, and you pump out more of it. Does anyone know why? Why does your body pump out more fibrinogen when you're threatened? Yeah, Selena. You get in your yeah, you're preparing to be bitten or scratched or slashed or attacked. So your body's now ready to clot. It's ready for the blood to clot. Prepare yourself for this attack. <laughs> but what happens if I repeatedly threaten you, but I don't actually attack you? Your body is constantly making this clotting factor, this fibrinogen in your body, and now that starts clogging up your blood vessels, for example, in your heart. And so if you're threatened by other people or you're low in the dominance hierarchy, your body comes to embody this threat. And what was natural and sensible in an ancestral environment, now in this type of a situation comes dysfunctional, and you are set up at risk, for example, for greater levels of coronary artery disease. And so, in fact, one of the deep ironies is that you might find higher levels of fibrinogen in relatively more junior office workers in the British civil service. So if you go and look at you know, British bureaucrats that are working in London in a completely safe place with plenty of food and water, and no one is attacking them and threatening to cut their bodies, and yet the fibrinogen level of low-ranking individuals in the British civil service is higher than the fibrinogen level of high-ranking individuals. That's weird. Why is that? Well, because our bodies are very sensitive to hierarchy, and those at the bottom are prepared for being attacked given the kind of ancestral environment in which we evolved. So it's maladaptive in this sense, putting you at increased risk for clotting in your heart vessels, which you don't need in that situation. So hierarchy of inequality, especially if long-standing and cumulative, can affect our health. The point is that hierarchy still matters because it always mattered, because we evolved to be sensitive to it in the first place. We have what is known as an evolutionarily conserved response to adversity that is adaptive in response to physical threats, uh, given that such threats were historically associated with an increased risk of wounding or bacteria. So in the olden days, you know, back then, you know, you might be threatened by, you know, another human being that's going to kill you or an animal that's going to eat you, and you have all these uh, neurological, endocrine, and physiologic responses which upregulate and downregulate all kinds of protein-producing genes in your body, and you get ready for antimicrobial responses and wound repair, like I just mentioned, and all kinds of other problems, all kinds of other responses. But now, in the modern world, you get social, symbolic, and imagined threats. You know, your boss yells at you. He's not actually going to kill you, but your boss yells at you, and you're like, oh my god. And so your body pumps out and does all the things you would have done in this type of an environment. Or someone just needs you, or you're stuck in a traffic jam. Just, you have no business producing fibrinogen because you're in a traffic jam, but yet you do, okay? And as a result of that, you get all these inflammation-related disorders. And we've been alluding, we've been seeing some evidence of this already in the class so far. So social, symbolic, and imagined threats that occur in contemporary social environment can also activate, activate these responses. And because, in fact, this system, this bodily system, can be activated by imagined social threats, even in the absence of a real threat, chronic activation can occur, and this promotes the development of all kinds of immune uh, inflammation-related conditions, cardiovascular disease, depression, metabolic syndrome, and so forth. And these psychiatric and physical conditions have substantial morbidity and mortality in the modern world. And indeed, stressors can be of many kinds and elicit various bodily responses. So a physical stressor is an external threat to homeostasis, to the regulation and integrity of your body. And a psychosocial stressor is the anticipation, justified or not, that some challenge to your homeostasis looms. Psychosocial stressors typically engender feelings of lack of control and predictability and a sense of lacking outlets for the frustration caused by the stressor. And both types of stressors activate an array of endocrine and neural adaptations. Now, an important idea here is that we adapt uh, to stress, in part because our nervous system was set up this way. I I'm pretty sure I gave you the sock example earlier in the lecture, in, the, in this class, did I ask you about your socks? Oh, yes. Okay. Feeling them coming. Did I ask you about spiders? Okay, so imagine that I, I uh, 
some of you who don't like spiders won't like this imagined uh, thing. Imagine that I handcuff your hand to a table, and then I put like a big spider on your hand, okay? And, and you just have to sit there with this huge spider on your hand. Now what's gonna happen? Your heart rate's gonna go up, you're gonna sweat, you're not gonna like it, I, I would hate it. Uh, you're really gonna respond in this really heightened, you know, tense way. You're gonna pump out fibrinogen, you're gonna prepare to be bitten by the spider or whatever else. And then nothing is going to happen. And then what's going to happen? Your body will get used to the spider in your hand and you'll calm down. Okay? And all of those things, your heart rate will go down, it'll stop sweating. That ringing in your ear that you hear will stop and you will calm, uh, calm down. But the problem is that chronic and repetitive activation of the stress response by chronic psychosocial stressors, such as close proximity to anxiety producing members of our own species, <laughs> can increase the risk of numerous diseases or exacerbate pre-existing conditions. In other words, low rank can be stressful. It's like I constantly handcuff you to a spider and unhandcuff you and then handcuff you. I'm repeatedly exposing you to someone, another human, who is making you stressed. And moreover, as Angus Deaton, the Princeton economist, has put it, the degree to which low rank is harmful to an individual is likely to depend on the number of people of higher rank because each such person is in a position to deliver threats, insults, and forced obeisance, or ultimate violence that generates stress. Individuals who are insulted by those immediately above them insult those immediately below them, generating a cascade of threats and violence through which low-ranked individuals feel the burden, not just because of their immediate superiors, but because of the whole hierarchy above them, right? So it's just this type of, like, you know, awfulness flowing downstream, uh, and the people at the bottom are really uh, damaged by this uh, type of hierarchical relationship. And of course, usually lower ranks or statuses convey more stress, and typically the lower you are, the more stressful it is. But it's an important thing to recognize is that rank or status is relative, not an absolute concept. Therefore, a link between status and health suggests the importance of relative standing. In other words, even if I somehow made, uh, you know, I had a hierarchy here of who's rich and who's poor, even if I made everyone richer, absolutely, the relative rank would still be there. And so being at the bottom is stressful, like we just said, because of the fact that there are people above you, not where you are on some absolute level, for example. So the key thing to understand about what we've been discussing today in terms of hierarchy and rank is that it's relative, not absolute. And it's very hard to eliminate relative standing, partly because it seems to be biologically hardwired in us, our sensitivity to the relative standing, and partly because the natural lottery is inherent, right? We can't efface the natural lottery. Some of us will have more appealing qualities than others of us just because we were born that way. So, so humans, in fact, have very clear ideas about their relative standing and about what it means to be relatively deprived of desirable attributes or goods. This is a canonical formulation of relative deprivation by W.G. Runciman from 1966, a book of this title. It says, we can roughly say that a person is relatively deprived of X when one, he doesn't have X. Two, he sees that some other people have X. Three, he wants X. And four, he sees it as feasible that he should have X. And this is what it means to be relatively uh, deprived. So let's look at some results from humans regarding the possible impact of relative uh, deprivation. This is a very famous uh, set of studies that was uh, done, in fact, in British civil servants uh, by uh, uh, by Michael Martin and his group. And so they introduced this notion of the social status ladder. And they sort of draw a little cartoon of the ladder. And here there are higher rungs of the ladder, one and two, and down here are the lower rungs, nine and ten. And these are the best off people, the most education, the most money, the best jobs, and the worst off people, the opposite qualities here. And we ask the respondent to say, think of this ladder as representing where poor people stand uh, in our society. At the top of the ladder are the people who are the most best, who are the best off, those who have the most money, most education, and best jobs. At the bottom are the people who are the worst off, 
those who have the least money, least education, and worst jobs or no job. Place an X on the rung that best represents where you stand uh, on the ladder. And so then the person is supposed to put an X to indicate it, and then you can elicit this information from subjects, what their perception of their relative standing is in a, in a group, for example. So this is some results from such one, so one such study. Um, this, side, this shows the self-perceived status on the ladder and prevalence of health problems in male British civil servants. So these are all men. They all have jobs. They all have safe jobs. They're working for the British civil service. They're in one of the richest countries on earth. What's happening to them when you ask them about where they stand with respect to their health? So this is their subjective rank, and then we look at the prevalence of all kinds of problems, like angina is a heart condition where you don't get enough blood supply in your heart, and we see that the prevalence of angina goes up as you get to the lower ranks of the ladder, pretty uniformly. Okay, it's not like there's a sudden step at some point. Same with diabetes, it just keeps going up. There seems to be a big step here from, from the, this level to this level, but it keeps going up. Or respiratory disease, or depression keeps going up from 10% of the people that are at the top are depressed compared to 42% at the bottom. Or overall perceived health. So there's an enormous gradient in these subjective and objective health measures that occurs at every single step in this group of people who actually have the needs at the bottom of the Basel's hierarchy of needs uh, already met. And these results show several uh, things. They show, first of all, that subjective social standing is important. And second, they show that there is a continuous gradient in numerous health measures uh, uh, measured by this kind of social standing. And third, as I've already mentioned, they show that this is observed even in a population of people for whom it's sort of odd that those at the bottom should somehow suffer bad health in this situation. And these results don't clarify the causal order, of course. Possibly it's your poor health that moves you to the bottom rather than being the bottom moves you uh, to have poor health. But they are powerful indicators that the relationship is not a step function uh, between the two. And data that is such as that shown here, with which, with which we are now also quite familiar, shows that being poor is associated with greater mortality and diminished prospects for survival. And no doubt, being very poor is bad for one's health. But this figure also shows a gradient. This figure is taken from, from the same reading you did the last time. It shows the association between income and life expectancy at age 40 in the United States. And it shows it for women and for men. First of all, women live longer than men. OK, so women are always above men. And second, uh, what you see is that the slope is slightly steeper for men. Money, as we learned earlier, makes more of a difference to men's longevity than money makes to women's longevity. Okay. And second, there is a hint of a step function, but only at the bottom 2 or 3%. Okay? So if you're in the bottom 1%, and I move you up a couple of percentage points, then you have an improvement. And then after that, it doesn't seem to make this much difference. So this may or may not seem obvious to you, but, but why should there be a continuous gradient in health by socioeconomic status? Why, why should the difference, for example, between $50,000 and $60,000, uh, you, know, uh, you know, or the difference between $200,000 and $300,000 matter? In other words, why? Why does it matter if I move you you know, from this point to this point of the distribution for men, why do men that go from, I don't know, 300000 to $500,000 suddenly live longer? And why do people that go from fifty dollars to $60,000 live longer? All these people are able to buy the basic necessities of life in our society. Well, here's another example of this gradient in a large sample of Americans. A different study. This study examined functional health status in over 330,000 Americans who are 55 years of age or older, again across the full socioeconomic spectrum. And there was a social class gradient showing that respondents with higher incomes have lower levels of functional limitation regardless of how far they are removed from poverty. So once again, if you look at the poverty line, like where you are, and then you look at your functional limitations, you see that the richer you are, the less likely you are to functional limitations, and it varies somewhat uh, by age, and the, and the relationship is uh, flatter in women uh, than it is in men, at least in, in, in some uh, age groups. 
But there's a, a gradient across uh, the whole range. Okay, so that's the phenomenon to be explained. And there are, in fact, a number of possible explanations for this gradient. One category of explanations is that relative differences in status might translate into absolute differences in life chances by affecting two key items in human needs. So how might relative difference in status translate to absolute differences in life chances? Maybe by affecting your ability to have autonomy near the top of Maslow's hierarchy, or maybe by affecting your ability to have social integration, again, higher to the top of, my, uh, of Maslow's hierarchy. And as economist Amartya Sen points out, it may, it may not be what one has that is important. It may be what one can do with one has that is important. Hence, a person's relative position on a scale of income may translate into an absolute position on what he calls capabilities. We're going to map your relative hierarchy to some abstract absolute scale, to, let's say autonomy or integration, and then that is what's going to then determine the relationship between socioeconomic status and health. So even though poor people in the United States have many times the wealth of those in other countries, they still may have shorter lives because they cannot do as much, because they suffer from a lack of autonomy and social integration, because they are less able to meet the higher demands on Maslow's list. So even though a poor person in this country is much richer than a rich person in an African country, that's not what matters. The poor person can't translate their resources into higher levels of autonomy or social integration in a way that a person, in, let's say, in an African country with lower levels of wealth can translate, lower absolute levels, can translate their relative standing into these, um, these qualities. So it may not be one's position in the social hierarchy per se that is the problem. It is what this position means for what a person can do in a given environment that matters. It's the extent to which position affects opportunities for autonomy and social participation. Now this link can perhaps uh, be partially broken by compensating for hierarchy. For example, by equalizing, even if we cannot eliminate the consequences of hierarchy, and by counterbalancing the natural and the social lottery as we've discussed before. For example, lower status can lead to low participation in social interactions and less reciprocity, and these are associated with worse health, but maybe we could make adjustments to give more opportunities for social participation for those that are excluded uh, in our society. Social participation is not merely something that high-status individuals acquire or make for themselves. Societies can, as a whole, foster or control participation. And this leads again to this idea of social capital that we'll discuss after the break. So the way many societies are organized could lead high-status individuals to be better or worse able to tap what social capital is available and to reap higher rate of returns on that capital. All right, so now I'm going to do a little experiment with you guys about relative hierarchy in class. So we're going to need to use your clickers. Let me see if I can get this little leader working. So I'm imagining there's now, it's now a, it's now a flower here. How do I press home? I'm sorry, home. Oh, okay. All right. So uh, do they need to know anything before they answer these questions, or they're all set? They should be all set. You're all set. All right. Okay, so. So here's some illustrations. Which of these would you prefer? So I want you to think about it. You're all going to vote A or B. Your current annual income is $50,000, and everyone else earns $25,000. That's option A. Or your current annual income is $100,000, and everyone else earns $250,000. Those are your two choices, OK? So which, do you, which of these would you choose assuming equal purchasing power in A and B? All right, so vote. I want to see some votes here. Is it going to just show up as people vote? I'll, sh I'll, I'll make it. Oh, you're going to have to share it. Oh, I see. Do you see it? Hmm? Do you see it? I do. Would you record these numbers for me? Sure. The percentages, just scribble them down. Is everyone done? Everyone expressed an opinion? Oh, OK. Hold on. You're thinking about it? <laughs> Thank you. 
All right. So actually, your group is quite interesting. You guys are 50-50 uh, in these choices. Um, and, um, and so this, this comes from this old paper. And in the original paper, 56% uh, of the subjects chose A, 44% chose B. Yeah, last time I taught this class, the majority chose A, 81% chose A, 19% chose B. Here in this class, you were also evenly split. OK, who voted A? And give me a reason you voted A. Someone. Yeah, come on. It's not hard. It's not a trick question. Just why you vote A? Yes, Ben. I mean, that way, um, assuming it's like equal purchasing power, you can get more, like a higher percentage of the stuff. Yeah, you get a higher percentage of the stuff, but you get less total stuff. Okay, so if he says, I want more stuff than anyone else has, even if it's less stuff than other people can. Who, who voted B? Okay, why do you vote B? Why do you vote B? Uh, Stephen? Yeah. yeah. I would have more in health, so like I'm, instead of comparing it to other people, what they have, I'd be happy with that. Yeah, so you're like, I'm interested in how much stuff I can get. I want my absolute standing. I don't mind being the poorest person in the group if I can have more. So you're saying, actually, it's okay that inequality is rising in our society. <laughs> you, said, you said it's okay that inequality is rising in our society so long as I can buy more stuff if I'm at the bottom. Karen Jean vote. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, other, anyone else want to offer thoughts on why they voted for A or B? Okay, 50 50. All right, so let's go. Let me see if I can get this thing to keep, keep working. Do I have to you could press switch. this each time or do you have to come oh, here? Oh, I'll come fix it. Or you can just call out the percentage. Okay. All right, here we go. Here's the next question. Um, okay. <laughs> Your physical attractiveness is a six, and everyone else is a four. Stephen, I want to look for consistency here. And, and, or your physical attractiveness is an eight, and everyone else is a ten. Okay, you got to pick. Everyone has to vote. All right. There's two options. You can't make the difference power assumption here. Seriously. Are the votes coming in? Mm hmm you... Next time we can set up my phone so I can see them. I know what I can do. Did everyone get in their votes? Yeah, everyone. All right, so here we go. Thank you. So here are the results. So in the original study, 75% chose A and 25% chose B. That's pretty consistent. You guys are uh, actually you're tipping more towards uh, kind of uh, absolute standards matter. You were 67, 33 this year. Okay, who picked A? Someone who picked A. Yes, what's your name? Rachel. Rachel, why did you pick A, Rachel? Uh, so, unlike person power, do you use objective, so I'd rather be prettier than everyone else, and relatively more ugly than more ugly than prettier. Oh. So you figure here, and what's, adva what's the advantage of being prettier than everyone else here? Yeah, you can have whoever you want to mate with. Okay, that's good. I don't want anyone to want to embellish Rachel's explanation for why an A is advantageous. Well, B, who picked B? Yes, uh, uh, Jalen. No, Ju Julius. Julius, yeah. <laughs> So you'd rather just be handsome or even though you're in this situation over here? There's really no difference, but the minor I'm sorry, you're making an argument that 8 and 10, there's no material difference, whereas there is a difference between 6 and 4. There's no difference I see. Okay, so you're saying, okay, so all right, so that's an idea. So if, since there's not much difference in either world, I'll just be absolutely handsome by being an 8. Other ideas for people with be. What's your name? Oh, I was an but, okay, why do you think A? I'm Anya. Um, Anya. I think A because it's like a self esteem thing. Like, I wouldn't want to think or know that I am the least attractive person. Uh -huh. I would rather, like, for my own personal sake, like, think I'm most attractive, and then I would, like, be more confident in Okay, so someone thinks, like, I want, you know, I want to be the top dog, uh, even if it's absolutely not so great. Okay, yeah, Selena, what do you think? Say that again? It depends on the sexual view. What did you say? Here. With the perspective, um, you can date someone who's really hot and still be like decently attractive yourself. 
if you're in, in, in me. Yeah, I think what, I think what Shalina is saying is that in this world, even if you're a six, everyone you're having sex with is a four. <laughs> Whereas in this world, if you're an eight, is that what you're saying, Selena? Thank you. So in this world, at least you get to have sex with hotter people, no matter what your standing is. These examples map, by the way, to modern political debates. Thank you, Selena, for that insight. Um, okay, so let's look at another example now. Um, so as one student, one Yale student told me years ago, I'd rather get the last pick of the eights than the first pick of the fours. <laughs> but if you think about it, like also think about housing stock and envy in our society, you know? Would you rather have an absolutely bigger house, or would you rather have a bigger house, a smaller house that's bigger than all of your neighbors, right? And so this is the tension in many aspects of how we allocate resources and hierarchy in our society. Okay, here's another example. Would you rather be the top student at the nearest community college to where you grew up, or be an average student at Yale? All right, everyone pick. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it. I think. Oh, no, I have to flip to the next one. <laughs> This is a dilemma that you all faced. All of you could actually have gone to any community college you wanted, and you could have been the top student at your community college, but you didn't choose that. You chose to come to Yale, and it looks like, judging from the data, most of you were happy with that. Uh, this is last year's data, but right now 93% of you said yes. There were few people who regretted coming to Yale. Would anyone like to confess who regretted coming to Yale and tell us why? Any A's want to chime in and say why they pick A? Other than they goofed or something? Does anyone want to defend A? Yes? Well, can't you still, okay, so like, can't you still, for example, probably not make a student have those games all, those would be usually average, regardless of what everyone has 4.0 or I'm sorry, speak up, I can't hear you, Julius. Regardless of what everyone still has 4.0, aren't you still average? Here, in the community college? What's not the community college well, well, the idea here is, is that if you go to the local community college, you're going to really outperform everyone else. You'll have a higher GPA. You're, you're the same human being, so you're, you're right. Your innate ability is the same. But here, you're performing better than you are here. Here, you're just an average student, for example. Would you pick A or B in that? B. You'd rather be at Yale, even if you're just performing in an average way. And there may be reasons for this, okay? There may be a variety of reasons for this, including what Yale, what a Yale education can do for you, not just in terms of what you learn, which is the thing I care most about, but also about the opportunities that it gives you when you graduate. All right, here's another one. You can have four weeks of annual vacation and everyone else has five weeks, or you can have three weeks of annual vacation and everyone else has two weeks. Yeah, and this is a very typical thing, and I hope little light bulbs, I can see them going off in your minds right now. This is like, it's really, from a professor's point of view, this is like, you can see the students, their jaws go, get a little, you know, or their eyes go a little wider, and you see the light bulbs lighting up over their heads. Because now you're going to explain to me why, in fact, this is exactly, you guys are the same as last year, okay? uh, not even 10%. So why? Why do you now flip? You will. You've reversed your preference for absolute versus relative standing by and large. Up until now, the majority of you have been picking a relative, have been picking um, absolute standing, have been down here, uh, but now you're picking relative standing. So why is that? Yes, Stephen. Um, because just because I'm guessing um, more vacations, they were like more downtime and generally benef more beneficial for your personal well being. So I'm more of morbid looking at it, and that's the fact of it being more rather than less. I take more vacation. So you want absolutely more vacation even if you're having relatively less than everyone else? Yes. Yes, and you, behind you, uh, you, sorry. You, yeah, what's your name? Lila. Lila? Oh, I have a lot more vacation. You should also you agree. You want more vacation, okay? And does anyone who picked the latter one want to offer an opinion as to why they preferred that? It's okay, I mean, because you're tired of your bed. Yeah, you, I just don't want to see everyone else having an extra week of vacation. Yeah, Ben's envious, and he would be really upset 
you know, some of you are going to get three weeks of spring break, and some are just going to get two weeks, and the two weekers are going to watch all the other three weekers of all this fun, but does not want the displeasure of that uh, explanation. Okay, now why is it that more of you prevent this? There's something subtly different about vacation days than, month, than income. Who can tell me what that is? Yeah. Okay, so there's something about the consumption of good quality of vacation that's valuable, like the experience of other ideas. Y yes, Lila? I was going to say, it's related to the social hierarchy. Like, you get a vacation day from the so the hierarchy has a lot of hierarchy, whereas vacation can sort of vary, you know, different jobs and different, you know, occupations do different, you know, not vacation, but they don't necessarily correlate. Okay, you're getting closer. You're all dancing around the, the real uh, reason. Yes? I forgot your name. Uh, Murillo. What? Murillo. Murillo. Yeah. I think uh, it gets to a point where the more money you have, you don't really get more benefit from it. Well, more vacation is always important. Okay, more. These are all good reasons. You're getting closest to the you know the, the real reason. So there's there's something about there's no there's a declining marginal return to money, but you're saying there's not a declining marginal return to, to liberty, to vacation. Yeah, you want to know what's your name again? Charlotte. Charlotte, yeah. I was gonna say like like four weeks of vacation is like the same to you regardless of how much anyone else has. Yes. Yes. Yes, that's exactly right. Vacation is not a competitive good. While vacation day, while vacation days like money and appearance are desirable, having more vacation than others doesn't confer any competitive advantages. But being handsome or prettier than others confers a competitive advantage. Having more money than others confers a competitive advantage. Having more vacation days than others doesn't confer a competitive advantage, unless you think that you know, you're more rested, so when you return to the group, you know, you're better, better able to, to outcompete them in some way. Okay? So there's something about a relative standing when it's in contrast or in intention with other people that can uh, be material uh, in this regard. Okay, let's do one, one last one. It's a subtle one, but it's one of my favorite ones. So is, you have to vote, is a hot dog, uh, uh, is this hot dog a sandwich, okay? So you vote yes if you think a hot dog is a sandwich, otherwise uh, vote no. Ah. So in some cases, though not really in the ones we've been considering today, uh, such effects can arise because of group solidarity and from what is known as in-group bias. And humans are very prone to this, and their affiliative instincts can be elicited in the most minimal way. So I just, I, we just elicited an opinion about uh, whether a hot dog is a sandwich or not. And, uh, and your data were that 42% uh, of you thought that a hot dog is a sandwich, and 58% uh, and of you thought it was not a sandwich. Okay? So a lot of disagreement about this important topic of whether a hot dog is, is a sandwich or not. Okay, so are you with me so far? Okay, now I want you to keep in your mind whether you think the hot dog, you're in the group that thinks the hot dog is a sandwich, or you're in the group that they think hot dog is not a sandwich. Okay, so now here's your question. Do you think that you should give $3 to everyone who agrees with me and give, and give $4 to everyone who disagrees with me about the hot dog sandwich question, or give $2 to everyone who agrees with me and $1 to everyone who disagrees with me? So what do, you, what do you want to do here? You're going to distribute some money according to whether people believe that a hot dog is a sandwich, and you have to pick between these two categories, okay? All right, so you're voting, which is great. Now you're recording all these things, right? Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, so, so un unbelievably, unbelievably, 75% of you pick B. 
You just can't stand the fact that people disagree with you about the hot dog sandwich dilemma. So you want to punish those guys. You're willing to, at the risk of punishing yourself. Uh, you said, I'll get $2, but everyone who disagrees with you on the important question of a hot dog sandwich is going to get less money, and you made that choice, most of you, except for 25%, compared to the other category. Yes, Lana? I was giving away my money. No, no, this is you're creating a world in which money is being assigned. Okay, so you're choosing now who should be rich and poor, those who agree with you on the hot dog sandwich question or those who do not. And the point of this experiment is that I just elicited in you what's known as a minimal group paradigm. With the most trivial and irrelevant thing, like whether you believe a hot dog is a sandwich or not, I got you guys to be in each other's throats, right? I got you to like think, oh, those sandwich-loving hot doggers, they should get less money versus not those people who believe that that hot dogs are sandwiches, they should suffer, okay? So I just, just with this stupid question, I got you guys to allocate resources in this very unequal way. Can you see how that happens in our society all the time, right? And how politicians ex exploit this natural tendency we have, which you Yaleys also have, despite being enlightened, smart people in one of the nation's, you know, world's most safe and wonderful environments, you want to stick it to those sandwich-loving hot dog eaters uh, versus uh, uh, not. And in fact, once the groups in this minimal group paradigm are formed, people really favor their own group to their own detriment over this really trivial uh, difference. And in fact, you are like most people, when this experiment's been done elsewhere, about 70%, you guys are just the same, pick uh, option B. Okay, so now, let's go back to the lab. Which would you pick? Now we just do it by raise your, raise your hands. Would you rather be A or B? Who would rather be A? Who would rather be B? Everyone wants to be A. It's better to be A in this situation. Okay. Now who would you rather be? Would you rather be A or D? Raise your hands if you'd rather be A. Raise your hands if you'd rather be D. Okay, so similar spread that you had before. All right, so some of you would rather be poorer than D, but absolutely better. All the experiments we had before. Or, you can imagine, would you rather be A or E? Who would rather be A? Who would rather be E? All right, so you can see that I can change where you are on this ladder. Obviously, anyone would prefer to be C than A, right? That's not a subtle point. But I can modify these numbers. I can make A, I can move it up, 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 or I can move E up, 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 or down, 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 and find your indifference point. And then I, you could, I can quantify the extent to which you're willing to trade off uh, absolute versus relative standing. Is everyone with me still? All right. Or now, which would you rather be? A, D, or F? So here, F, I compress the letter, OK? The rungs are closer together. Who would rather be A? D, F, F, what's, what's better about F? Yeah, um, uh, that's Charlotte, that's Lila, and you're, are you Anya? Anya, Anya, good, um, got it. Because there's like lots of a difference between yeah. you and the person on top, so it's not necessarily. Not necessarily, so you get some of both, right? You get some of both, actually, you get both, you get both being absolutely better off, but you're not relatively so much worse off if you pick uh, F. And as you're probably all anticipating, this is the Ghana USA Sweden example that I gave you earlier. Okay? So what's happening here is that when you move to Sweden, you compress the ladder. Okay? You shift the relationship. All right? And even in this contrast, you might rather be the poorest American than the rich Ghanaian. Not exactly, because the rich Ghanaians are, you know, incredibly rich. But you get the gist of it. All right? All right. So, um... So let's look at some additional evidence for this and the preferences you uh, have expressed. One hypothesis flowing from the observations we made earlier about the biology of hierarchy and stress in primates is that relative deprivation will matter to an individual's health. And the idea, again, is that it's not so much one's absolute deprivation, if any, that matters, but one's relative deprivation. So what do we mean by relative deprivation? We mean that low income or status relative to a reference group can affect your health. This relative deprivation is the difference between your own income, let's say Y sub I, 
and the average reference group income, given that that income is greater than y sub i. So your income compared to the income of those people who earn more money than you. So relative deprivation is a so-called upward-looking, individual-level measure that depends on the incomes of others. So unlike the Gini coefficient, we introduced last time, that is measured at a collective level, relative deprivation is measured at the individual level. Each person's relative deprivation can be computed. So if you have a richer reference group, you have a higher relative deprivation. So if I put you in a, in a Yale college, where by chance everyone else is a billionaire, versus I put you in a Yale college where by chance not everyone else is a billionaire, you're going to feel relatively deprived in the first case, but not in the second case. So the richer, the, so you have the same wealth, but now you're looking above you and you're like, oh, those people are much richer than me. Relative deprivation describes an individual standing. It's different for each member of a group. Okay, every one of you has a different relative deprivation, just like you have a different income. And inequality is the same for the entire group. It describes the distribution of income. So every one of you is exposed to the same income inequality among students up at Yale. Now here is the math for one measure of relative deprivation, the so-called Yosaki index. Uh, and you know you don't need to stress about this for those of you that have problems with equations, but it really is not doing much. It's just say for person i with income y sub i, who is part of the reference group with n people, you compute for every person for all y sub j greater than y sub i. So you look at, you take me, I'm i, and you look at all the people, j, who have more money than me. And you subtract their more money minus my more money. Okay? You subtract the difference in income between me and every person who's richer than me. You sum that, and then you divide it by n, which is not the number of people richer than me, but the number of people in the whole group. That's crucial. Do you understand what you've done? So I take your income, I go among the class, and I see who has more money than you. I compute the difference between you and each of those people, and I divide it by the class size. And then I take your income, and I do you have different income than her, and so different people are richer than you, and I do the same calculation, and I divide it again by the whole class size. Does everyone understand? So I compute for each of you your relative uh, deprivation. And this is why, for example, Warren Buffett is not deprived by billions of dollars compared to Bill Gates. But the difference in their wealth, which is considerable, is divided by the entire United States population. So if their wealth differed by $3 billion, and there were 300 million Americans, Warren would be relatively deprived compared to Bill by just $10. You take $3 billion, which is the difference in wealth, divided by 300 million, and you see the relative deprivation of Buffett compared to Gates is just $10, okay, when you do the calculation. And it's also possible, and I won't go into that today, it's also possible to compute a downward-looking measure, which is really depressing, I forgot what it's called, and that is the benefit you get from being able to stomp on people below you, okay? So it's really a awful, yeah, Eric is like, can you believe it? Like, who thinks of this stuff? So, you know, it's like computing, like, how much more do you get from all the people who are below you in the distribution. Now here's some examples giving the relative deprivation for people with different incomes and with reference groups chosen according to where they live and their age. So what it says is it looks at, here's, a, here some, here's the relative deprivation populations, and, we, and the reference group is formed by uh, people who, let's say, live in Hidalgo, Texas, or in New York, New York, and their age category. So here are the incomes. And we say that if you're 21 to 25 years old, and you earn $25,000, if you're in Hidalgo, you're relatively deprived by $4,725. But you should have the intuition that if you live in New York, you're much more relatively deprived, right? Because New York is richer. Young people in New York earn more money than young people in Hidalgo. So for the same income, it sucks to be in New York, whereas it's not so bad to be in Hidalgo. Or if you're a 21 to 25 year old and you earn $100,000 and you live in Hidalgo, you're relatively deprived by a tiny amount. But in New York, it's still a lot. You're as relatively deprived if you're a 21 to 25 year old earning 100 grand in New York as if you're a 21 to 25 year old earning $25,000 in Hidalgo, right? About five grand, about five grand. You see that? Now, of course, you could compute it for other age groups, too. You know, of course, older people earn more money, but you can do a similar calculation. 
All right? The point is, for a fixed amount of money, you can do more. You can translate that into capabilities that allow you to do more stuff in Hidalgo than in uh, New York City. One standing in the hierarchy.